I'd like to start by asking you a simple question, and if you could raise your hand, how many of you have pets or used to have pets? Wow, most of the audience, myself included. I'd like you to imagine your pet now: your dog, cat, hamster, or perhaps even a fantailed goldfish like Polygon, my companion about a decade ago. And in case you're wondering, she is called Polygon because she had this octagonal shape on her gill. I'd often sit entranced by her aquarium as she absorbed, so completely absorbed in her world. And I think it's fair to say that many of us form a very deep emotional connection with our pets. We revel in their personality traits, uniqueness, and intelligence. And some of us might have felt the heartbreak of the loss of that pet. But I'd now like you to imagine if you were. Instructed to perform a scientific procedure on that pet, a procedure known to inflict pain or lasting suffering, you may be required to administer a toxin, or perform a surgery that would lead to debilitating disease. And at the end of the experiment, you would have to, to euthanize that animal and harvest its tissue. Now, obviously, to most of us, this would be a deeply unsettling, even disgusting thought. After all, we think of our, our pets as family members. It also clashes with our intuitions about animals, their capacity to suffer, their similarities to humans. And yet, this is the reality for tens of thousands of scientists using millions of animals worldwide. In the U.S. alone, about eight hundred thousand dogs, cats, and monkeys. Are used in research, a figure that pales in comparison to the estimated tens of millions of rats, mice, birds, and fish, animal groups that are specifically excluded from the U.S. Federal Animal Welfare Act. And when you think about it, how we relate to other animals is full of contradictions. We cherish some as pets, but relish others for their meat, and extinguish more as pests. The intelligence. Of a pig might rival that of a three-year-old child, and yet, by rationalizing its role as food, we may place their sentience below that of the dogs and cats we have as pets. So it's perhaps hardly surprising then that some of these dissonances also extend into our culture of animal testing. Animal testing is deeply embedded in our scientific traditions, going back at least to the second century A.D. with Galen's vivisections on pigs and a variety of other animals. It's the method we've relied on, refined, and taught to generations of philosophers and scientists across the centuries. And yet, animal testing is an interesting topic. It's a highly contentious, both within and outside the scientific communities. What's striking is the divide between public opinion and views that are held within the community. Though, in 2015, a Pew Center research study poll found that while 87 percent. Of scientists affiliated with the American Association for the Advancement of Science supported animal testing. That figure was only 47 percent of U.S. adults. What's even more striking is that the views of students differ from those of their professors within academia. A 2019 poll at the University of Wisconsin-Madison found that while 35 percent of students saw there was something wrong with animal testing, that figure had dropped to 20 percent of faculty. A figure even lower. In biology faculty, compared to those in the humanities, so what is it? Why is it that individuals' views when they go through academia on animal testing seem to change? Well, to see how that might pan out, I'd invite you to remember what it might have been like to step into the world of biology for the first time. Perhaps at school, you might remember your anatomy classes in biology, faced with a, a tray with a frog, say, or rabbit laid out for dissection. Usually not made out of wool, though. I would add. <laughs> Now it's presented something as a as a hands-on way to learn the machinery of living systems. And while you might felt a bit uncomfortable about doing it, you don't really see any opposition to it. And without rapidly approaching end of semester exam, you decide to go ahead with it. Now fast forward to college, and you might now be sitting in lectures between half-sipped cups of coffee, maybe coming in at、uh, five minutes later at the back of the lecture hall. Where experiments from on animals are flitted on and off screen, and in the articles and textbooks you'll read, the results of those experimental manipulations might be presented as cartoonish illustrations, 
perhaps a bit like these, some figures that I took from one of the art, one of the textbooks we used to teach in your biology class here at Emory. As an undergraduate, you might also get accustomed to the full life cycle of an animal experiment, from breeding through to euthanasia, or sacking, the lingo you might get used to using. You also get accustomed to reading these cage card uh, items. You get accustomed to referring to animals by means of breeding date, experimental condition, and uh, cage number. Students are often discouraged from naming their animals. So this objectification of animals, in addition to some of the surrounding scholastic pressures that you're under continuously as a student in biology, may make us think about and act on animals in ways that might have seemed inconceivable to us before we came into academia. So how much of a problem is this chronic exposure to animal testing? Well, we know that it can desensitize students, as it can researchers. In fact, past surveys of students and researchers show that, compared to counterparts in non-animal labs, they're more likely to experience elevated distress and anxiety associated with working with animals, and in the long term, burnout. One particular student, for example, said, I'm a student, I, for the first time I saw my lab mates working with mice, and when I helped with dissections, I went home and cried. Since then, I've managed to compartmentalize my feelings towards them, and didn't break down when I gasped three to learn cervical dislocation. So students and researchers face a bind. You know, on the one hand, they might feel a tension between their ethical values and what they're being asked to do or learn. But on the other, they feel that by not engaging in these practices, it might somehow derail their career or research objectives. Those that they see rely on animal models. Another student said, I'm a biology student, and I have to decide on my specialty for next year. I want to go into biomedical sciences, but I have to experiment on animals. I don't know if I'm strong enough. I love animals, but I also want to help people get better. And even now, it feels like something of a mouse in the room, as it were. A topic that's hard to discuss, whether it be with your principal investigator, your PI, or even with other lab mates. You either find ways to cope with it, or you choose another field. And as a student in cell biology, who later moved into neuroscience in my master's and now PhD, I witnessed this firsthand in lectures that taught both the modern day and classical experiments in neuroscience, the likes of Hubert Weasel's work in cats, seminal to our understanding of the visual system, or Thomas Graham Brown's work in cats and dogs whose spinal cords had been severed to study the motor system. And while powerful experiments, there's really, it was really accompanied by an ethical discussion about, firstly, the animal morbidity the experiments involved, or if we were to design the experiments afresh, how we might have done so in a way that avoided it. And I'm reminded in one particular instance, as a master's student, I was working on mouse pups between the ages of zero and two weeks. And during that time, I struggled with a paradox. A paradox of, on the one hand, performing procedures that I could see visibly causing suffering to both the mothers and the pups, but on the other hand, seeing this suffering as necessary for the biomedical research that could advance human health. And I'm reminded of one instance in particular during that time, when going over to one of the lab fridges to collect a sample, and so confronted with this mass of whole vial brain, whole, whole uh, vials filled with mouse brains, seemingly flow out of the fridge and roll across the floor. It was a sobering reminder of the cost of scientific progress, to say the least. But it was also a moment that I realized that I had a choice. That I could go down that path, force myself to normalize this level of, of periodic use of animals and eventually killing those animals, or I could find an alternative, an alternative that didn't involve animals. And it was a path that led me from working on young mice, as you see here, to working with young humans at the Marcus Autism Center, where I'm now doing my PhD. But how do we resolve this paradox? Are we forever doomed to trade animal suffering for human well-being? To acknowledge the rich mental lives of these animals, while also binning human interests at their expense? Well, ethical values in research continuously evolve at a stunning pace sometimes. Once, 
it was considered more permissible to perform experiments on humans, non-consenting humans. We heard earlier about the Tuskegee syphilis trials. But as a result of ethical and legal reform, we no longer perform those experiments. And some would argue that a similar ethical turning point should happen when it applies to other animals too. But the debate is complicated, and it's complicated by the fact that animals have been, have been seminal in several of our scientific discoveries throughout the past and current century. The developments of the polio vaccine on the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, to name a few. But for every success with animal models, there have also been the many unstated failures and defeats. In pharma, about 95% of drugs that are developed in preclinical animal models never make it to the intended human population. And much more of that research isn't published. So we, it raises an important question, which is how much of the animal research that we do is important for human health? And how much of this persists due to historical precedent? By addressing this question, it puts us in a position where we can actually reduce much of our reliance on animal models. For example, a Dutch study investigated 110 research projects and found that often researchers overwhelmingly chose an animal model not on the basis of its relevance to the research question, but on the availability of existing resources, both institutional and expertise. And while, of course, animal models are not yet irreplaceable in all aspects of research, we should feel ethically and scientifically compelled to exhaust all those options before we use animals as a last resort. And fortunately, this paradox that we've been facing is not a fixed reality. It's one that's continuously redefined by emergent technologies. And I'm pleased to say in the 21st century, we have an exciting armory of emergent technologies, both in biomedical work as well as our work in computational um, science. I'd like to touch on two of those main approaches now. The first of these are organoids. Oh, yes. And this is the Belmont report, very important. Organoids are foundational components of our work in molecular science. They allow researchers to capture complex cellular interactions in a 3D environment. The power of organoids is that stem cells can be taken from any participant and made to self-assemble into a variety of different organs. And so far, we've been able to create brain organoids, lung organoids, skin organoids. The beauty with these mini organs is that they are actually quite representative of the organs that they try to capture, all within human models. They've already been applied, for example, to study Alzheimer's disease or Zika virus infection that you see on the right here. But beyond brain organoids, we've also been able to use organoids to replace our reliance on models that have used rabbits in the past, for example, in testing cosmetics by means of skin grafts uh, created via technologies that can take cell, uh, stem cells from humans to derive these models. And I'm proud to say that here at Emory University, we even have an organoid hub, a central resource for scientists to be able to study the nervous system in both disease and in health. The second of these approaches related are organs on a chip. Like the first, they use cell culture but combine us with fabricated materials in order to capture a complex set of interactions between different tissue types. In fact, you can even string together different organ types, including lung, heart, bone, skin, combine it into a type of vascular apparatus and even airflow, allowing you to capture complex organ interactions on a dish. The power of this technology is that it is also cheaper than animal regulatory testing, and allows you much faster throughput of, for example, testing drug-body interactions. For example, a team at Columbia University was able to use this multi-organ on a chip to test a variety of drugs of liver drugs, including doxorubicin, finding rates exper of experimental clearance that were comparable to when they were tested in human uh, subjects. Another team at the Wies Institute, a forerunner in developing lung-on-a-chip models, used such a model like this in order to develop and screen for treatments during the course of the pandemic, allowing for a much faster throughput of treatments against the fight of COVID-19. And I'm excited to say that many areas that historically relied on animal testing, especially in cosmetics and environmental toxicology, have now shifted to the use of these emergent technologies.
For example, Canada recently became the 44th country to ban cosmetics testing. In the US, eight states so far no longer use cosmetics in animals. They've also updated their environmental protection laws to screen out animal testing when it comes to the environment. And across the world, a number of centers have been founded in order to evaluate alternatives to animals. In the States, for example, we have the Alternative Fund for Animal Research. So where do we go from here? Well, animal testing is a debate that remains prevalent both societally and scientifically, but one that you all have a say in. By looking at polls collected from the public, a series of emergent trends come about. The first of these is that animal testing is usually acceptable only when it's done for medical purposes, when it can only be done in non-human animals, translates well to human health, and minimizes the amount of animal suffering involved. In contrast, the approach we often use when it comes to animal testing are the three R's, which are replacing the existing models we have with animals and into uh, into animal alternatives, reducing the number of animals we use, and refining those approaches to minimize the suffering involved. By taking uh, information from our public and allowing that to guide when we consider that research to be permissible and when it is not permissible, we can drive changes in our legislation in order to advocate for research that will, will advance you, the target consumer. For example, some scientists have even advocated for a fourth R, responsibility, ensuring that the work that we do has a clear link to the broader societal impact. Of course, core to this model is also individual action. And perhaps the lowest hanging fruit comes in cosmetics. By looking out for these labels, you can ensure that your choice of branding doesn't involve products that were tested on animals. But I'd like to end by asserting the importance of students in this discussion. By proportion, undergraduates and graduate students make up the bulk of work that's done in science in the lab. Simply by choosing to incorporate animal testing, choices of animal models into your selection of a lab, questioning outdated procedures and pushing for those alternatives where they exist, you can drive real material change at all levels of how science is funded and conducted. Wouldn't it be great if we could do our research, let's say come home from the lab, put your lab coat up, and not have to feel this compartmentalization between the animals that you use in your research and the pets that you might have at home, if the two could sit readily in your mind? It's a bold and perhaps uncharted territory, but one that I think our collective resources are very well placed to put us in. Thank you.